Aloha, I'm your host, Peter Rossig, and you've joined the Two-Wheel Revolution here on ThinkTechHawaii.com, where we talk about all kinds of personal mobility, e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, e-skateboards. Uh, eventually, we'll talk about electric wheelchairs. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Uh, stick with us the whole half hour. I think we'll have a fun micromobility moment at the end, but you're going to have a very interesting conversation. Aloha, it's my pleasure to introduce Kiana Otsuka, who is with the Hawaii State Energy Office, uh, also a member I know of the, uh, the Mayor's uh, Biking Advisory Council. Uh, Kiana, welcome, and, and uh, start out by telling us your title. I try to do it, but my tongue gets tired. <laughs> sure. Hi, Peter. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, I have a very long job title, so brace yourselves. Um, I am the Vehicle Miles Traveled an active transportation specialist. Okay. Wow. All right. So let's talk about vehicle miles traveled, um, which uh, I think, you know, most people probably have an idea, but what does it precisely mean? Yeah. So vehicle miles traveled is simply a way to measure how much we drive. So it could be measured in like sheer number. So, you know, today I drove 10 miles, for example, um, or it could be looked at over a certain period of time. So it could be an annual measurement, it could be a monthly measurement. Um, and then more interestingly, um, it could also be a per capita measurement. So uh -huh. we could do an average of a, how much people drive in Hawaii per year, for example. So um, it's really just a simple way to describe a measurement of how much we're driving. Okay, and I've always wondered, you know, a vehicle, uh, and a Hummer, even an electric Hummer going 10 miles with one person in it is one thing. Uh, my little uh, little Toyota Celica with six people in it, uh, you know, that's a whole different ball of wax. So how, is there some way to distinguish those things, or is it only possible to consider a any kind of vehicle and how many miles it goes? Um, so there isn't a specific way to distinguish between the number of miles a smaller vehicle drives and a larger vehicle, but that's sort of how we capture um, how efficient a vehicle is, is that per capita measurement. So someone driving a smaller car with more people in it is far more efficient than someone driving a large car um, sure. as a person alone. So that's something we refer to as a single occupancy vehicle. It simply just means driving alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you do your calculations include buses uh, and vans, or is it uh, again? You know, are we just we just say a vehicle, whatever kind of vehicle it happens to be? Yeah. So um, this measurement, or the the data that I mostly use, is via the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. So they take an annual measurement of the amount of the amount of vehicle miles traveled per person. Um, and doesn't we don't we don't know whether it's a light duty vehicle, medium duty vehicle, or heavy duty vehicle. So it's simply just everybody and how much we're driving. Okay, I guess when we all get our chips implanted, uh, you'll be the the government will be able to keep track of all that kind of stuff. But until then, it's kind of a it, it's a good indication, but it's it's somewhat of a guesstimate of how it how it works. It, it, am I right about that? Yeah, for the most part, and I think um, the, what we're working on implementing potentially is the road usage charge. Um, so we'd potentially be able to have that data per vehicle, but at sure. the moment it is a, a mixture of um, vehicle registration data. Um, our state DOT takes average uh, annual average daily traffic counts, so that help we use that to sort of estimate how much people are driving. So it, it's yeah, it's it's relatively accurate, but there's still some guesstimate yeah, involved. You, as you I work with it, especially for comparisons. To, but um, is it different somehow than just saying, "Look, there are more cars than people here on Oahu in the state"? I guess, uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, is that the just the number of vehicles is not enough? Is that a fair way of looking at it? Yes, correct. Okay, so. Um, how do we uh, reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled? That's uh, that's your question for today, tomorrow, and the rest of the year. Uh, it is, yeah. What do we do? Uh, what do, what do you do? do? What do I do? Um, so we're really working on trying to expand transportation choices for people. 
um, through a number, number of different ways. So um, I'm really focused on um, transportation and land use strategies. Um, so we are trying to make it easier, uh, more affordable, more convenient, more accessible for you to uh, drive your car less, um, or even like for you to carpool, for example. Um, we really want less people driving alone is sort of the goal so that we can reduce the number of people uh, driving altogether. So what that looks like, for example, is, is uh, in the bike context, since we're focused on bikes today, um, is making it uh, easier and safer for people to take their bikes um, to where they need to go. So we're really focused on um, the interested but concerned rider. I'm not sure if you talked about that on your show before, but yeah. that's the majority. Oh, okay, great. That's the majority of folks um, who are currently not biking. It's a good chunk of our population mm -hmm. um, and would only bike if they felt safer. Biking, for example, is one of the primary concerns. So things like implementing more protected bike lanes um, would help folks feel safer biking. Um, and then there's like the land use piece of it, right? So if people can't bike to their daily needs, whether it be work, maybe it's the grocery store, maybe it's dropping their kids off at, at school, um, they're mm -hmm. not going to bike either. So making sure that we have good land use in place that allows people to complete these trips that can be made via bike that are close to home, for example, um, or maybe once they get to, you know, work, maybe they work in town, maybe now they feel they can bike um, to do their errands while in town, which is something that I do. So really working on trying to make it easier, safer, more accessible, more affordable for folks to get on their bike, uh, as well as other modes of transportation that aren't driving alone. Uh, so uh, there's two parts to this, obviously. One part is the policies and the actual and the implementation of the things you need. And the other part is the convincing these uh, interested or concerned, but not riding too much people. And uh, what's the balance or is there, uh, you know, how much of what you do involves this policy part? Uh, is the other part, you know, left to Biki and Hawaii Bicycling League or or others? Or how does that work? Yeah, I think at the moment, my job isn't uh, really involved in policy. I think we're sort of working our way up there and trying to figure out what kinds of policies would be um, helpful and impactful here. Um, at the moment, we're really focused on, or actually, I'm really focused on completing studies that would inform policies. Um, so at the moment, I'm working on a mobility hub study for the island of Oahu, looking at state-owned parking facilities and figuring out which locations are great candidates to be converted to a mobility hub. Okay. So a mobility hub would be, uh, or simply is the co-location of transportation services. So maybe you have like bike share, scooter share, you have um, maybe a car share there, like in conjunction with like the community space really thinking about like how we can provide the transportation service to people, for example, who don't own their own bike, but would still like the opportunity to bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at these, for these kinds of places, are you, are you limited to uh, publicly owned places? Because it always seems to me, you know, there are church parking lots, which uh, except for Sunday morning, mostly sit empty. And it seems like that's mm -hmm. a, a place where there could be a, uh, uh, a hub. Is that possible or is that kind of outside what you can realistically do? Uh, so the study I'm working on is focused on state-owned properties um, sure. just because it's a lot easier for us to coordinate and, and execute a potential mobility hub. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly other um, entities could implement a mobility hub. So, so somebody could decide they want to do it on their own, so to speak, and, and mm -hmm. you know, get, get Biki to put a uh, put a station in front of their near their park on their parking lot and make the the space available during the week. No parking on Sundays and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. If they, it's probably got huge liability implications for a private church or or uh, nonprofit or something. But it's possible. Yeah, it, it certainly is possible. I think it would just take a lot of. I mean, the same thing with us. It just take a lot of coordination and working with different entities to make it work. Got it. Of course, and it, especially. When you start putting it in any kind of infrastructure, I've worked for Hawaiian Electric and uh, getting getting uh, people to agree to put in a, an electric vehicle charging spot was was almost the easy part. Getting the infrastructure <laughs> and the wiring and so forth uh, that was the next easy part, but not easy. Yeah. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. a big thing there. And what about the city? I mean, the city, you city and state not talking to each other on this one. 
The city uh, is working on a bunch of different mobility hubs that are really centered around the upcoming rail station. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we just identified the need to look more closely at state-owned facilities to do this work. So um, Mm -hmm. the city is definitely working on it. um, And I think they're they're hoping to work on implementing more mobility hubs and providing more options for folks to get around to. Okay. And uh, I also saw in your bio you're working on, is there still, I hope, maybe this is an old bio, I don't know, shift worker transportation demand management, another mm-hmm. tongue twister, but what, what does that mean? Yeah, so I have a project going um, that looks at developing some strategies that would address shift worker uh, transportation challenges. So we think of a shift worker as Maybe someone who doesn't work Monday through Friday, maybe doesn't work nine to five, maybe doesn't work in a high employment center like Waikiki um, or downtown Honolulu and thinking about how can we best serve their transportation needs. So this is often a population that's that's not focused on in the transportation planning process. Our planning process is really focused on people who work nine to five, who work in primary um, employment centers. Like So you'll notice, like, for example, bus service is not as good in the evening. Um, you know, isn't as good when you're not going in and out of town, basically, or like these kind of primary urban core areas. So really thinking about serving folks who have limited options uh, because of their income, because of their ability, uh, because of the time that they start or finish work, things of that nature. So really focusing in on these folks who have uh, limited mobility options and or maybe uh, feel like they need to own a car to get to and from work because services at the moment don't serve them. So really, uh, this is a project I'm really excited about. Um, I think is really kind of um, really innovative um, for for transportation planning purposes. So I'm really excited about it. So we're just getting that started now. Um, okay. And our next phase is to engage with a community-based organization directly and have them do engagement and outreach to a prioritized population. Um, and then looking at developing an action plan to figure out what's it going to cost, who we need to coordinate with, um, and then looking for funding and hopefully at least piloting a shift worker uh, transportation demand management strategy. All right, that's very cool. I hope when you get a little further down the road on that, you'll come back and 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 talk to us and involve us. We'd uh, right. I'd love to use this show if we can to uh, help whoever that community based uh, organization is to get out to the public or you know to have their meetings. Uh, available to people and so forth, because I think that's great. I would imagine, again, safety being probably the biggest single consideration for most people in the bike, uh, in using bicycling. If you're a shift worker and you're going to work in the dark or you're coming home in the dark, I would imagine that makes it a little more complicated to get you to to ride a bike. Would that, is that about right? Yeah, we heard some of that initial feedback at our, we just had our first working group meeting and that was something that was indicated as a concern, um, lack of lighting or lack of facilities for people to feel safe to get to and from home and work. Okay. I I, uh, I had a guy on the show not too long ago uh, who runs a company called Llama.com and they basically do, hard, do software uh, enhancements for scooters or electric bikes that increase safety by giving you some of the same things that a Tesla has. You know, if you're in a Tesla, you can see all the cars that are moving around you. You can see yeah. uh, the people that are, are near your uh, the front of your car and so forth. Some of that's doable on a bike or a scooter. It's just cost money. Yeah. And, and the other thing I, you know, I, I, I'm a, a slave to, uh, to, to gadget websites. So uh, there are all kinds of, of, uh, uh, lighting things that, you know, you create one kind of lighting creates your own bike lane uh, and, and another one kind of, you know, you've got front and rear lights and so forth. So mm-hmm. uh, how do you get, you know, I mean, the first thing is to get people to think about it. And the next thing is to get people to feel safe again. It seems like same kind of same kind of problem. Yeah, I've, I've seen those. They're really neat. I think those present like an, an income inequality or inequity challenge. So those obviously cost money. Um, mm-hmm. And I and I'd like I like bikes as a means of transportation because it is a really affordable and really sure. independent means of transportation for folks. And so thinking about folks who can or maybe can't afford these additional technologies to help them feel safe, I think is a big issue. I think 
providing um, lighting and like more protected facilities would certainly help um, without having to ask people to purchase fancy technology to feel safe while getting yeah. to and from work or wherever they're going, really. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these things to me, I, I just wrote a piece for Civil Beat about how Bicky needs to expand its footprint and add electric vehicles in basically in the name of equity and, and diversity. Uh, uh, you know, there are people probably in Kalihi and pl places to the West who would ride a bike to their job at Alamoana or Waikiki if it were safer, if there were a Bicky uh, station nearer to them. And, you know, basically if there was an electric bike that they could share because Let's face it, nobody wants to get to work huffing and puffing and sweaty and everything, or at least not most people. So it would seem to me it's all kind of interrelated in terms of getting people to uh, consider the biking as a possibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, to go on a little bit, the other part that you, that's, we, this is kind of, we're talking about the personal, the second part of your endless job title, uh, personal mobility. Tell me again what <laughs> I'm sorry. Tell me the second no, part. It's okay. Um, active transportation is in there. Okay. So tell yeah. me what active transportation is in 25 words or less. Sure. Active transportation is really focused on uh, people walking and biking. Uh, and I consider active transportation also in transit. Um, so you have to most likely walk or bike or scooter or roll whichever mode of transportation you, you want to use to get to a bus stop often. So I really consider those as sort of our active and shared forms of transportation. So walk, bike, roll, transit. Okay. By roll, you're talking about scooters, skateboards, anything with wheels. wheels, anything? Yeah, it could be a wheelchair even, um, but really anything with wheels. And I try to include the word roll just to be more inclusive. Um, right. I'm always are running not into on bikes. I'm also always running into that. You can say biking and everybody understands what you mean, but then yeah. you get into scootering and skateboarding and one wheeling and and mm -hmm. next next show I'm going to have my micro mobility moment is going to be about these new uh they're called moonwalkers. They're like moon skates, walkers. but they they're electric. Uh I I've already shown some electric inline skates which scare the hell out of me, but these are more like uh like a regular uh old-fashioned kids skate they're about four or six wheels and they're electric powered and you walk but it enhances your walking uh ability it's like being on one of those uh walkways at the airport you know you're walking but because the sidewalk's walking with you you're going faster uh, and these are very similar they're they're kind of personal and they look a little more to me a little not very realistic for most people or many people but uh, a little bit better than online electric skates. So um, I think we're looking at a world of, of expanding innovation and opportunity in the alternative transportation area. So, uh, you know, which is good uh, and also a little scary and a little bit, uh, the, you know, the the other problem I see is, is there's kind of, we're kind of coming to some kind of potential conflict. We've got bike lanes and the traditional cyclists, many of them feel uh, these electric bikes are, you know, they're going, they have more power, they have more speed. Uh, I don't like them or I don't, I'm worried about them. And then you get the skateboards and the scooters and the and, and all the rest. Uh, do you see that as being a problem, a kind of, uh, you know, confrontation, especially here in Hawaii, where, you know, even the best uh, best bike lane is not going to be as as big and as as pleasant as in other places where there's a lot more land. Are we heading for some kind of a conflict between different kinds of riders? You know, Peter, um, when I was in Portland, Oregon, I went for a bikeways training for work. And it's really amazing um, how sort of everybody using different modes um, are able to kind of very safely navigate like the what is more traditionally considered like a bike facility. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's I think it's possible for folks to coexist. I think it'll take some getting used to, um, especially because sort of the electric personal devices are a lot faster. Um, but I certainly feel like they can help fill in a huge gap um, for people who are sort of interested in, you know, not driving as much to actually get out of their cars and then use these devices. Like you said, I think people are really concerned about being sweaty here, right? It's really hot. Um, so I think we, we can navigate it. I think certainly there will be some conflicts and some kind of getting used to. Um, and, and I think Portland's 
facilities are a little bit like wider and a little bit thicker. Um, so I think as we see more demand for non-auto mobility, I think I'm hoping that we'll see more, you know, and wider and better um, non-mobility facilities being built. Okay. And um, I think the getting used to part is very, very important. I think whenever these discussions come along and people start talking about Amsterdam or Copenhagen or even Portland, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, you got to stop and remember it took Amsterdam or Copenhagen, what, 40, 50 years to become these incredible biking, uh, biking metropolises. And, uh, you know, I, I would guess that at the beginning when the when the city fathers and mothers decided to do this, they met a lot of resistance, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, is perfectly understandable. But uh, I think we got to, you know, we got to try do the thing. We got to bike along at the rate we can bike. And then when as we get more bike lanes and we get more bikes out there, you know, it's kind of a circular argument. If you get more bikes, you'll get more bike lanes. If you get more bike lanes, you'll get more bikes, right? So mm -hmm. I think that the getting used to it part is going to be the challenge uh, because we all would like things to, well, most of us would like things to go faster, mm -hmm. except when you're trying to make a left turn off King Street and you're, you know, got to look for the bike lane. Then I'm thinking, I'm, uh, I'm you know, people are still mumbling and grumbling about that one. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay. really interesting. Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Peter. Oh, okay, yeah, I think it's really interesting that um, the city has put out reports saying that uh, the King Street bike lane has also increased pedestrian safety. So they've seen less crashes, less, less deaths, things of that nature because the King Street bike lane was put there. So I think like even if people are going to grumble, um, I'd like to think that like it is like a, it's also a safety measure that helps everybody be a little bit safer, including people uh, walking and biking and then also like less crashes for people driving. So I, I hope that we can, you know, think about safety as a priority um, rather than sort of like how, how fast can I get to where I need to go in my car? You know, I think it yeah. helps people slow down and, and really notice other people, other road users who aren't in their cars. Exactly. That's what's not what I think is good about the traffic calming and uh, Poly Highway, which I use a fair amount to get over to Kailua and back. Uh, they put in some speed bumps. And, you know, always going over them, you think, eh, is this absolutely necessary? But in your that's kind of your your emotional uh, response. But in your or in the other in your head, you know, this is actually making things safer for a lot of people, uh, not just uh, cyclists, not just car drivers. Everybody could afford to go a little slower, especially on an island like this one. So um, that's uh, that, that's terrific. Anything else you want to talk about with uh, active mobile, active uh, transportation or, or uh, vehicle miles traveled? Anything else that's going on that you feel, uh, you know, is important to talk about at this point? Yeah, I just want to add a, a few more things, Peter. Um, the reason Great. why we're, we're so focused on trying to reduce our vehicle miles traveled by expanding our transportation choices is because we know that we don't currently have the capacity to power everybody's electric vehicle. Um, so we know that if we need to power 50% of the existing cars on Oahu, that we'll need between six and 13,000 acres of land for us to renewably power those cars. So that's just half of the cars on Oahu. That's not statewide, just half of the cars on Oahu. So thinking about because we live on an island, Land is so precious, land is so scarce. Um, what would we rather use that land for? Um, if we don't have to power so many vehicles, we could use that for agriculture, open space, affordable housing. We could use it for helping to preserve the rural character of certain neighborhoods and sure. areas statewide. So really thinking about how can we reduce our energy consumption or energy demand for powering vehicles by then expanding Choices for folks to choose uh, if they want to to use more energy efficient modes of transportation. So I, I always find that number to be really startling, um, especially for folks who live on an island that will require so much land to renewably power um, our personal vehicles. Right, and, and I've seen statistics. Even if everybody, even if everybody had electric vehicles, we would not be. You know, we would obviously be in better shape as far as emissions are concerned, mm -hmm. and 
uh, and, and climate change impacts, but it, it's not going to do it by itself. Uh, even if everybody were driving electric and that would, you know, be a long-term goal, it's that's not enough to help us control the climate change that we're seeing every day. Yeah, and, and electric, I always remind folks, electric vehicles aren't fully zero emissions, especially when our power source is not fully renewable, right. but it takes a lot of energy to manufacture and produce electric vehicles, um, the like our lithium batteries that go into electric vehicles, as well as sort of the particulate matter that comes off of both conventional and electric vehicle tires, right? So there yeah. are other environmental concerns with vehicles in general, and if we can have less vehicles on the road or more efficient use of our vehicles on the road, we'll see less of those um, environmental challenges come about. So yeah, I would like to remind folks, electric vehicles aren't fully zero emissions. They're low, lower emissions, typically, yeah. again, depending on the power source. Um, right, and, but, and, or, yeah. and origin of the materials and the, the factories yeah. in which they were made and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think at least some of the, the automakers realize that you, you, can't, you can't make an electric vehicle using old-fashioned uh, kind of energy consuming and, and, and raw material consuming systems. You have to try to make those within the limits possible as efficient and, and as carbon free as possible. So we're all, it's all good in the right direction, I think, but it's not, uh, it's not, it's not a solution by, um, by itself. So we only have a few minutes left. So tell me about your, uh, uh, your bad, your good habit, your good habits. Your uh, yeah. your bicycling habits. You you bike a fair amount, I take it. Yeah, I, I try to bike as much as possible. So again, like a land some land use challenges, right? So I live in suburban Honolulu with uh, a, in a really hilly neighborhood, so it's, it's mm -hmm. quite tough to walk. Um, so I don't bike in my neighborhood personally, but what I do do is I take the bus into town for work or for me of my recreational activities, and then I hop on Beaky. So I use Beaky to make those like nice short trips. I could make on the bus, but I, I know I have to maybe sometimes wait for the bus. Um, and I enjoy getting the exercise. So I'll take my uh, my Beaky from like downtown to like Ward or Kakaako to go to yoga or you know to meet friends for Palhana, things of that nature. And I, I really try to sneak in as much biking as I can because I don't live in a very bikeable neighborhood. So whenever I'm in town, I try to get a bike ride in if I can. And that also helps me with my with my job, right? Being an informed um, person on a bike helps me to make better decisions and advocate for other things at work. So right, I really try absolutely. to get in a, a bike ride as much as possible. So uh, yeah, lots of, lots of biking while I'm in town, but not necessarily from home directly. Got it. If there, you've, I'm sure, thought about an electric bike, would that be, or, you know, there's some places that even are too hilly for that, but would that, would that meet your needs in terms of to and from home? Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about that more often because my car recently uh, broke and I'm trying to sort out my transportation. So sometimes I'll drive to the transit center near my house because yeah. the bus stops running at 6.30 p.m. And so that means I either need to be home before 6.30 um, or I'm not leaving the house or I need to get an expensive like lift ride home. Um, right. so I've been thinking about, I think it's about three, two, two, two or so miles from my house. And I've walked it before it took me an hour, um, because of the hills. And mm. so I've been thinking about like, should I get an electric bike to meet that need? But I think I'm a little worried that the infrastructure in place worries me a little bit in terms of biking home. Yeah. Uh, but my my dad just bought my mom an electric bike, and she's like too afraid to. My mom does. My mom also doesn't have a driver's license, so before I was picking her up in my car and taking her places <laughs> when she needs to go places, well. right? So she's mobility constrained because she doesn't have a driver's license. But uh, she bought one for my mom, bought an electric bike for my mom, and she's been too afraid to use it. So um, to be honest, I'm a little afraid to use it. I've not not been on an e bike before, but I thought maybe one of these weekends I'll take it out and see if that is a good um, option for me to take the e bike on the bus maybe to get just to and from that um, the transit center to uh, my house. So I recommend yeah, it. Something and I think there, there yeah. are some bike shops that will uh, give you some lessons or at least get you started. Oh. So I, I encourage you to do that. But I am glad you're out there experiencing the real the reality of of, uh, of active transportation and vehicle miles travel. Kiana, thank you so much. This has really been interesting. I've learned a lot. And I do want you to come back when you've got more to tell us about some of these things you're working on, the hub study. Uh, the shift worker transportation demand management part, I think, is mm -hmm. especially interesting because it you got a specific audience that you're trying to reach and trying to influence. So that would be great. 
And now Thank I you. am going to uh, put the cherry on the on this cake and uh, give you your micro mobility moment. Uh, here we go. This is every week I try to talk about some weird or wacky or wonderful thing in the world of electric uh, transportation. Go to the next slide, please. And um, this is a cake electric bike. It's made in Sweden. Oh. And uh, the uh, it's used primarily, or they're very big on using it for utilitarian purposes, uh, delivering, caring, caring family and so forth. And the owners got interested in, uh, in wildlife preservation. And it turns out that there are these huge wildlife preserves in Africa, thousands and thousands of square miles. And the poachers come in and the only way to get to them is on a, a with an all-terrain vehicle or a motorcycle. But of course, in the middle of the night, you can't sneak up on somebody in, on a motorcycle. So next slide, the uh, folks at Cake outfitted some of their uh, electric bikes with some special provisions so they could be used in the bush. And now these guys who are really, uh, you know, braver than I am because they are out there trying to catch poachers, uh, they are using these electric bikes. You know, one more slide to um, to sneak up on the poachers because they can. They're so quiet, of course, they can get right up on the poachers and trap them, and you know, save the save the earth by saving the wild animals of Africa. So uh, that's my that's the micro mobility moment. You can look up cake. It's called Ride Cake. I think uh, you probably can't read this, but if you can pause it, you can grab this. Uh, link and it where you can see a video about it, but I, I think it's one of the fascinating uses, uh, special uses of electric vehicles that make them fun and interesting and active. So thank you again, Kiana. Uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you for being here on the show with us. Uh, I, as I said, I insist on you coming back. I want to hear more about those those studies, and I, I hope to see you at the either at the mayor's advisory council or. Uh, getting together to figure out how we can make cycling and all other transportation better here uh, in Honolulu and across the state. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.